we're going to go ahead and get started, guys, with the uh, – actually, there's a video I want to show first. Um, so bear with me just a second here as I load up the video. i got to find it. It's got to load, it's got to load, it's got to load. I got so many things open on my computer right now, it takes me just a second to find all this stuff. And many of you guys have maybe seen this video before, and um, I understand why. Uh, as you can see, I'm just pulling from YouTube here. But uh, I just kind of want you guys to have a look at this video. And you're going to see some um, remarks about the video, but if you haven't seen this video, you notice that the firefighters, of course, at this point, they have a basement fire. They got heavy smoke um, above the basement fire. And then you've got a, a gentleman firefighter here who decides to break every window in this uh, first floor. I think you probably all with the basics, if you have a basics in fire dynamics, understand what he's done. And you'll see the conditions in that area start to just completely worsen. And there kind of the smoke lit off. We had a little, a little um, smoke, which I, I assume everyone knows what smoke is. It's just uh, particles of un, uh, that are unburned in the air. And now we've got an untenable situation. So if we had, a crew on that first floor doing some kind of search. That first floor is no longer tenable for anyone, including firefighters. The whole reason behind that video for us to show for this particular class is for me to place uh, a little bit of responsibility, right? Who is at fault for a mistake that was made there? Is it the firefighter with the pike pole who's breaking the windows? I mean, a, a certain amount of fault can be laid at, that, at the feet there. But in my opinion, it's the officer. Who's in charge there? Who's the guy or gal who's making the decisions based on what's happening at that fire scene? And who is the person who has responsibility for the crew at that fire scene? As an officer, you have to be able to take on the responsibility of not just yourself, not just the actions that you're going to take, but you have to be able to be responsible enough to take on the responsibility for the actions of those in your crew. So the issue with that, that guy, and, and this is old school firefighting guys, it used to be that when you showed up at a fire scene and there was a fire and there was smoke, a lot of times, some fire departments just went around and they broke every window in the house um, because that was thought, ventilation was thought to be good, and that's what you did. There was no tactical uh, ventilation. There was no coordinated fire attack. It was put the wet stuff on the red stuff and break as much stuff as you can because that's what makes firefighting cool and fun and, and all that other jive. But now we know, we know what fire does when a certain amount of oxygen is, is issued. Um, we know what smoke, how smoke moves. We know terms like neutral plane and flow pad. So as fire officers, we have to be a jack of all trades and we have to be responsible. We have to be competent and confident, but we have to be responsible for not just ourselves, but for our crews on fire scenes. But going back to the get jack of all trades, as fire officers, we have to understand all of these fire dynamics, especially. We have to know what's going to happen to a fire when we introduce air, when we introduce water. Um, how is a building going to react when we have a certain amount of fire impingement? All of these things. How do we, a fire officer has to know how to get the hydrant, how to move the hose, how to ventilate a building. Heck, a fire, a fire officer should probably know how to, um, how to pump the truck. You never know when you're not, when you might get a new person on that pump and they're not gonna know what they're doing. So as a fire officer, it's your responsibility uh, to understand the ins and outs of everything on the fire scene. And as such, 
you have to have uh, the wherewithal and the knowledge to be able to make decisions on a fire scene that can impact everyone, not just yourself or your crew, but they might impact uh, the rest of the firefighters on a scene. Those decisions are gonna impact the community, um, whomever is the homeowner or neighbors. So there's, there's a lot of weight on the shoulders of the fire officer. But uh, in order to assume that position, you have to be responsible for all that weight. So we'll move on here to our PowerPoint. So as you can see, it's the base company officer. And leadership, you know, what is leadership? We just kind of went through uh, some of the characteristics of leadership. I would say, you know, being responsible, being competent, and being con confident on a fire scene are all very important uh, products of a company officer. Why is it important to our trade? Why, why is it important? Because you have to know when to advance and when to pull back. Um, the lives of you, uh, your crew, and other firefighters or, you know, residents in the building, victims, they all depend on your um, competence. What we do is high risk and it's low frequency. Um, what I mean by that is it doesn't matter if you are the busiest company in the state of Illinois. Um, you are still going to get a fairly low frequency number of house fires uh, as compared to the rest of the time. For most of us in Illinois, for the most part, we're waiting for that next call. And, but when we don't do go on that next call, it, it can be a very risky situation. So it's important to have a solid leader who can step up in any situation at any time. The good fire service leader will dominate the events which surround him. Once he lets the events get the better of him, he will lose the confidence of his men. And that, when that happens, he ceases to be of value as a leader. And when, you're, um, when you're, your people follow you, when, when your uh, driver, jump man, uh, other firefighters on a fire scene, when they follow you, they expect you to make a decision. They expect you to make that decision with confidence and to be able to do, uh, to do it correctly. Now, is that to say that every time we make a decision, we're going to be 100% correct? No. And it's probably something that's important for every fire officer to kind of know and understand. We're not perfect. We're just like any other uh, uh, leader in any other position. That doesn't make us infallible. We're going to make mistakes. The, the issue with the mistakes that we as fire officers can make is that it can cost somebody their lives. So we have to understand that and we have to make, there is that expectation that has to be on our shoulders of, uh, of being competent. The, what we have to understand is sometimes it's better to make the decision, whether good or bad, then sit and flip flop over what to do for a certain amount of time. Because time is everything on the fire scene. I think we all should be aware of that. So as a fire officer, you have to make decisions and you have to make them quickly with an understanding of all the events that are going around. You have to be able to intake all that information and then give orders, uh, make decisions. And you have to do those quickly and accurate. Now, like I said, sometimes, you're not going to be 100% right, but it's better to make that decision and go with it than to fiddle faddle, fiddle faddle, wait, 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 and then make a decision that may be right, but by that time, it's too late to uh, have any impact on what we're doing. So one thing too, Nate, real quick. Um, one thing that helps you be a confident officer too is knowing the abilities of your of your guys on your truck and in your department. Some of you on a really big department, you won't know everybody. You won't know the guys coming in and out. For us in Quincy, we, we know everybody on our shifts really well. We know the strengths and weaknesses. And as an officer of your company, you should take your guys out. You know, hey, we're a little weak in ladders. So we need to practice that. So that way we get to the scene. I know we can have ladders thrown 
you know, confidently and, and quickly, you know, if you don't practice that stuff and know the abilities of your firefighters and know where you're at, that's going to, you know, you can make the best decision, but if you're, if you don't have guys that can follow your orders and, and do what they can because you haven't practiced with them and got them to be where you need them to be, yet you fail as an officer too, because you need to recognize those things and, and work with your guys and make them the best they can be. So any decision you make with those on those guys on the fire ground, you know, they can do it quickly and efficiently and to your standards. So. All right. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly important to know who you're working with. Uh, most of us on are on fire departments that are small enough that you know the first name and where everyone on your fire department lives. Uh, you probably know their wives and their children. So you should probably understand their uh, benefits as firefighters. What are they good at? Do they, are they good at advancing hose? Are they good at uh, understanding ventilation? Um, does, does one person know how to pump the truck better than another? Uh, you're even going to know the weaknesses, and we all have it, guys. So I'm not, I'm not pointing out uh, bad things about any particular fire department, but we also have weak firefighters on, on nearly every fire department in the state. And you know who that weak firefighter is in your fire department. And you as a fire officer have to understand how to get the most out of that firefighter on a fire scene or in general in everyday life how can you make this firefighter better uh, and that's an important aspect of being a uh, a fire officer is making your firefighters better and uh, specifically you know picking up the ones that need help in some areas so the expectations of a firefighter so you're going to have expectations from the community from the fire department leadership and other firefighters and yourself or your family. So what's expected of you? Uh, whatever it takes. You want to be competent, professional, honest, dedicated, problem solver, uh, life and property saver. You got to be compassionate. Um, you know, these are all the hallmark cards of firefighters. Why did we do what we do? We do it to help people. And uh, if, if you are honest with yourself, and that's why you've, you've tried to join this uh, great profession, it's, it's, um, it's explicit upon you to be professional and, and competent in what you do. So in order to be a good leader, you need to set examples um, and set good examples for others to follow. So 11 principles of leadership, are you proficient tactically? Do you know yourself and can you improve? Do you know your personnel and look out for them? And that's kind of what I was talking about a little while ago by uh, knowing uh, everyone on your fire department or at least in your firehouse. How can you help them? Uh, are you, do you keep everyone informed? Do you set a good example? Uh, do you ensure that tasks are understood and, and completed? So, as you work with uh, firefighters below you, as you become that company officer and, and you get uh, the confidence and you get hours in your belt, hours under your belt on fire scenes, on car accidents, on EMS scenes, when you start working with other firefighters over a certain period of time, you're going to start to understand and know uh, how they work at scenes. And so, supervised is something on this list at number six. Uh, where all the tasks understood, supervised, and accomplished. There are times when you're going to be able to tell your one of your firefighters, you don't even need to tell them, you know, did, did someone get a blood pressure on this uh, person at an EMS call? You don't even need to do it. You know when you arrive, you got a firefighter who's going to get that blood pressure cuff out and he's going to take it. It doesn't necessarily have to be supervised or even the order given. And that's, that's all about knowing your personnel. Um, and be sure you train. And that's why most of you are here right now as you're training, which is an important aspect of an officer. Make timely decisions, sound timely decisions, develop your sense of responsibility. You want to, you, you report in, your subordinates want to look up to you as a decision maker. Uh, employ and handle the group in accordance with their capabilities. We've kind of uh, gone over that. And seek responsibility and accept it for everyone's actions. So you are the one that is responsible for the actions of your crew. 
can't, I can't stress that enough. So the qualities of leadership, so personnel supervision, thorough and detailed knowledge of the business. And so the detailed knowledge is important. Like I said, we've got to be a jack of all trades. And that's kind of what this class is going to be about, guys. It's, it's going to be about uh, the down and dirty basics of firefighting and how that works for the officer. So you have to have the ability to communicate and explain orders. How, how well do you give those orders? The commitment to ensure that orders are correctly executed. Are you prepared for combat, prepared for battle? Do you know your job? Are you battle ready? Um, in the battle, battleground of, and Murphy's rules of combat, they're an interesting uh, little thing. Everybody's probably heard of Murphy's law, but if you look them up, they'll give you plenty of tidbits. Um, one that I like in particular is uh, it, that is pretty apt to um, fire officers is you were smart enough to think of a plan, stupid enough to try it, and lucky enough to survive said plan. So think about that as you're uh, giving orders on a fire scene. The fire ground versus the battleground. They're, they're, they're very similar situations, so we have to be prepared for what we are getting into. Um, so in order to be prepared, we have to know the basics of fire. And fire behavior is kind of where it starts, guys. Fire dynamics, how fire moves, how it works, how it, how it eats, how it breathes, how it moves. And then along with that, you know, smoke. Where does smoke move? Um, we're gonna get into this, but uh, BAGIT is an important acronym uh, for us. And B-A-G, where's it been, where's it at? Where's it going? I know it's kind of an old school one, and there's there's more that you can find out there that are important. But if we know where it's been and we know where it's at, we can generally tell where it's going. And we're like I said earlier, we're going to get into scene size up in particular uh, quite a bit because I think it's a very important um, trait for company officers. How do you size up a scene? And, and scene size up, to be right honest with you, should be ongoing. As a matter of fact, scene size up should be happening uh, right now. It's part of this class. How to, when we learn fire behavior and, and how to react as officers, we're starting a certain process in the scene size up where we allow ourselves to make better decisions. It's also ongoing as you drive through your districts or towns. What do we see? What types of buildings are we driving by? And I encourage you as, as firefighters or fire officers or, or whomever is here, is as you're driving through, look at the buildings and think to yourself, if this building was on fire and, and maybe you know, mentally put the fire somewhere on the building, how would you go about fighting it? I mean, is it a three-story commercial building with several, several thousand, tens of thousands of square feet? Am I going defensive? How am I going to keep it from uh, jumping the street to another building? What are, what are the thoughts that I have to have? And that's all part of scene size. Up. Now, when we do our exercise lately, we're not going to uh, go into that. Of course, we're going to do a specific scene size up as you pull up. And, and I'm going to show pictures. And, and I'm just going to want you to give me a scene size up. And we'll explain uh, good products of scene size up and maybe some bad. but. Keep size up in your mind. It's an important part. So what's burning? What's the fire load? So what is inside the building? How will it affect the container? So the container is the building, you know, and then the fire load is the stuff burning inside. And is the container on fire? That's an always important thing for us to understand as well. And then what tactics, what decisions, what are we going to have to do as fire officers? Of course, it's where we work. So we have to understand this stuff. So what are the contents that are on fire? Um, the contents are, is it the contents and the structure? Is it a flammable gas like we've got here? Um, we've got a, a rolled over hazmat scene, it looks like, with probably gasoline on fire on the ground. How do we attack that as firefighters? And in order to understand that, we have to have the basics and hazardous materials what types of fire streams or devices are we going to use when we roll upon stuff like this. So the fundamentals of fire behavior. So for this, we've got 
we've got a container. So we've, the box is the container, and inside we've got a fire. Now that fire is burning. As it burns, it produces energy. And as it produces energy, it's, it, it becomes uh, a higher pressure in a, in a certain volume. So the volume of the container generally doesn't get bigger as you're burning. And you, you have this, uh, this higher amount of energy inside a smaller container. Going back, sorry. So, and what, what fire generally does is, like I said, it, it produces a, a higher pressure, and then that pressure is trying to find release. It's trying to get out. So just like water, it's going to find the least path, the path of least, least resistance. So as officers, we have to understand where this fire is going to go. And to kind of understand that path of least resistance or flow path in today's termage is where is it, you know, how is this going to work? Is it, if, it, if it is self-vented through the roof, okay, we know then where that path of least resistance is. All that smoke and energy is generally going to release itself through that vented roof area. Now, not, I shouldn't say all, a, a good portion of it. And when it self-vents, um, our conditions on the, in the fire area are going to lighten because a lot of that uh, hot gases and smoke are going to release into the atmosphere. It happens as well when we, uh, um, when we vertically ventilate, if we've got a hot fire that's pushing uh, heat and smoke. So just more, more thoughts on fire dynamics here. Uh, the greater the mass, the greater the fire resistance. So if we have a 2 by 12, it's, um, of course, not going to burn as quickly as, say, you know, we have uh, sawdust. So we're going to talk real quick about endothermic reaction. Uh, this is the reaction within whatever is starting to heat up. So the ambient temperature at 70 degrees, we get a small amount of movement in the molecules, not much. But as we just raise it 19 degrees, those molecules begin to shake and move in there. And as that, as that temperature increases with that shaking and moving, you're going to start, um, at, if it hits its ignition temperature, uh, you're going to get pyrolysis. And then pyrolysis, I'm assuming everyone uh, can understand what pyrolysis is. It's the off-gassing of solids generally and that that is what you see as flame. It's the off-gassing and those gases then uh, heat up and produce uh, heat and light. So now we have an exothermic reaction. So endo, inside, exo, outside. And the exothermic reaction is generally what we're going to see. It's our flame. Let's go back here. This is important because as we have our exothermic reaction, we have to understand that the fire is working not just on the fire load, it's not just working on the stuff that's inside the building, it's working on the building itself. As fire officers, it's an important under, we have to be, um, we have to know how long, you know, flame impingement will last on a truss, on a wood joist, on a, on a joist, a floor joist. Those are all things we have to kind of understand by just by looking at it. How long is this building going to last before it starts to destroy itself? And do we have time to make a proper attack before that building equal, will collapse? Real quick too, Nate. With that being said, some of you guys in a rural area, you got to think about how long was that fire burn before you got called in? How long does it take you guys to get to the station? How long does it take you to get to the scene? So how long has it been under demolition before you guys even get there in a rural area? And that might even be paid departments. Like for us in Quincy, we can get pretty much anywhere in our district within three to four minutes, but we still got to judge how long has it been burning prior to that. So as an officer, you've got to be thinking about that, you know, time of day, how long has it been burning, stuff like that are, are big decisions you got to make on whether you're going to go interior or defensive. So, Cool. Uh, and, and it is important. I mean, what is response time? And some of us are lucky enough to have fairly quick response times, and some of us aren't. Um, even in the city of Quincy, there are areas where we're not going to get there 
uh, right away. I mean, we should be there within three or four minutes, but those three or four minutes are very important when it comes to fire dynamics and behavior. Uh, we all know the difference between your old school uh, furnishings, the stuff that is actually made of wood and, and wool and, and materials that were found in the 70s, and then today's hydrocarbons and materials that are made of plastics and are really just fuel that are, that are uh, constructed to make things comfortable like couches and beds and or, or even some tables that are made of particle board and, and glued pieces of wood together. Uh, but fire behavior is very important for us to understand flow path. There, there's a 40-hour you know, class that I would encourage all of you to take on fire behavior, whether we're talking about flow path or neutral plane, uh, coordinated fire attack, rapid fire growth, uh, and its causes, you know, talking about backdraft and and flash over and all of these other things. But we have to understand the changes uh, in the materials that are in buildings now. And not just the materials, I guess, but the way buildings are made. And that comes to building construction, uh, fuel load, and other things like that. We can get into, uh, like I said, a 40 hour class on a lot of this stuff. So uh, train, 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 not just for this. IFSI has several classes that that uh, can benefit anyone, not just fire officers, but, <coughs> excuse me, um, but all of us, if we continue to train. So ventilation, it, we can uh, reduce the temperature production um, and the application of water into the burning fuel stops the exothermic reaction. So we're talking about the fire tetraheater in there and we're introducing water and stopping part of that exothermic reaction. Temperature uh, is a measurement of energy, and the smaller the container, the faster the energy will increase in temperature. And that should be kind of well understood. If you have a small room with a lot of stuff to burn, as the energy and temperature increases, if you know in that smaller room, if you had the same amount of material in a larger room, that energy and temperature wouldn't increase at the same rate. So flashover and why it occurs, Lack of ventilation, um, these are um, reasonings for flashover. And we talked about it just a little bit ago on the, the plastics and the hydrocarbons in today's uh, firefighting world. <clears throat> We've got a, a lot of increase in hydrocarbons in, in every aspect of our lives. If you just walk through your home and, and like I said, look at your couch, uh, look at the tables. I mean, don't get me wrong, many tables are still made of hardwoods and, and things of that nature. But I would advise many of you, especially in newer homes, to go to your basement and look at the I-beams that hold that basement up. Are they actual, I'm looking up right now at the I-beams in my basement. Are they actual, you know, two by, two by 12s, two by 10s, or are they made of, uh, uh, composite I-beams that are put together with uh, particle board and glue. <laughs> now, the weight uh, that those things can hold is incredible and they're cheaper, cheaper to make, quicker to make. And like I said, they still are gonna hold uh, the same amount of weight. But if you watch videos on how they react to uh, fire impingement, you know, they're, going, they're not going to last as long as your, your original two by 12. <clears throat> But back to flashover, we're talking about this stuff in our house and how it um, will react. And you can find videos all over the internet um, on the, the old school house. Uh, they, they built a room with an old school couch, an old school table, old school chair, and they light it on fire. And then they put the new um, materials that we have today. We've got a new couch, a new chair a new table, and they light them off in small rooms side by side. And it's amazing how quickly flashover happens in the new room as compared to the uh, old, older, old school stuff. I mean, you're talking 10, 15 minutes on the old school stuff, and you're talking two minutes, three minutes, four minutes on the new stuff. So 
where we do business and our reaction times have to be so much better and quicker now. We also wear our full turnout gear and gear has become incredibly efficient over the last 20 to 30 years, especially in the last 10. Um, we as firefighters can get too deep into a building and still not understand just how much heat is being generated in the room that we're in simply because our turnout gear is so good. It will, will be warm, but we won't be too hot to the point of un being uncomfortable. So we have to be able to use our eyes, um, especially in our face masks, to understand what's going on. Um, eyes and ears, because of course, when we get into some situations, we're not gonna be able to see anything. So to watch out for flashover, we have to understand what happens just before flashover. We're gonna have off-gassing of everything in a building or in a room, in the room. Uh, specifically, if you're lucky enough to be in a place with carpet, if you start seeing off-gassing on that carpet, get out, get out now. It's an important uh, uh, sign that flashover is imminent. We're gonna have, like I said, off-gassing of everything. You're gonna start to see rollover of the smoke above your head. So be prepared. <clears throat> it is a ignition of everything combustible in the room. And all of that stuff in there is going to heat up to that uh, auto ignition temperature. So get out. It can occur as little as two minutes. Sorry. After ignition. So it, it, happen, it can happen quickly, especially in today's day and age. So be aware. Um, like I said, there's, there's plenty of information out there on flashover that can help us as firefighters understand the dangers. So building construction, like I was talking earlier, as fire officers, we have to be a jack of all trades. We have to understand uh, a little bit or a lot about everything. So the next thing that's probably important to us after fire dynamics is building construction. How are things built? And how do those things react uh, when, you know, under the hazards of fire? Occupancy types, uh, entanglement hazards, what's the floor layout? And when we're talking about size up, uh, floor layout can be important. Many of you, I'm sure, are able to uh, do tours throughout your districts of maybe larger buildings, facilities that you have. If you get the opportunity to get inside those buildings, do so. It, you don't want to be uh, completely in the dark if you have a problem somewhere at a large facility in your building. You want to be able to understand the layout of those buildings before you go in there. Fuel load, what's in there? What is burning uh, in the building? Fire behavior and extension probabilities. So where's it going to go? Bag it. Where's it been? Where's it at? Where's it going? Entry and egress. Do we need a ladder windows before we make entry? Uh, do we need to, need to make entry on a second floor? Fire attack and control. Coordinated fire attack is a term that I want everybody to kind of understand. And if you've not have heard of coordinated fire attack, we need to understand it. You need to, to look into how it works. And really it's just talking about coordinated your, coordinating your attack with ventilation, uh, with, with, with water, how, under understanding and rescue, all of these things have to be coordinated together in order to have an optimum fire attack and control. So if you find you know, a, a second story um, fire, if you show up, you got a two story building, you got fire visible from a second story window, but you got a clear first floor. It used to be, you know, balls to the walls fire service. We took that attack line, we hit that front door running. We made our way all the way up to the second floor after pulling you know, several hundred feet of attack line to get up there and attack a fire with a small uh, hose line, you know, inch and three quarter, inch and a half. In today's fire service, we've realized that it's okay if I've got fire showing from that second window to hit that window from the exterior, whether that's a deck gun on your fire truck or two and a half with a short line, but knock that baby down before you make entry. 
or maybe you're lucky enough to have enough guys to be able to knock it down from the exterior while you're making that interior attack. But we found that it's, it's um, a good change of pace and it, it lowers uh, the heat and the smoke. It'll, it'll lower your visibility, of course, up there as well, but it's gonna make the ultimate outcome more positive for us if we're able to hit that fire earlier rather than later. Most important thing we can do is get the wet stuff on the wood stuff. <clears throat> life hazards are also important, important, and we are the life hazard. We are also the hazard on building construction. As a fire is burning through a building and we arrive, are we going to lessen the issue uh, on that building? Are we gonna lessen the weight and the devastation on that building before we're finished? No we are generally going to add to the problems of that building before we leave. Don't get me wrong, we're putting the fire out and that is ultimately going to be the best thing for that building or business or, or residents. But we're also gonna add the weight of, you know, several hundred pounds of firefighters, several hundred pounds of water. Um, so understand that building construction can be affected in our work, not just by fire, but on what we are doing to that building, whether it's adding water or people or moving things, breaking windows, uh, destroying doors and other things. So know your enemy. The building is on fire, is under demolition. That's, that's uh, probably a very important thing to understand. And we need to understand collapse zones and building types We've all got, and, we, and we're going to get to a little bit of uh, building types in a, in a bit, but we've all got downtown um, whatever USA. In Quincy, of course, we've got our main street, and we've got all of these masonry, you know, ordinary construction buildings. And all of those buildings, you know, are built in a similar, similar time and in a similar fashion. And what we have to worry about, and, I and Steve, of course, have seen these things fall over under fire conditions. We have to understand uh, collapse areas and zones and how those uh, interiors of those buildings will work under fire conditions. So here's our classifications. We've got type one, fire resistive. Um, and it is just kind of what it sounds. I mean, nothing is fireproof. And you've probably all heard that before, but fire resistive, is a uh, class one. You've got everything is pretty much made from non-combustible or limited combustible materials. And uh, these are designed to contain uh, products of fire and combustion into one small area and hopefully, you know, into the room of origin. <clears throat> and the main fire hazards are what are the contents. So if, if you've got a, you know, a high rise that's a type one, Really the stuff that you're worried about fighting as a fire are all of the contents within, um, within those apartments, the, the, the beds, the, the, the tables and chairs and, and stuff that the people have brought in. Type two is non-combustible. Almost everyone has seen this before. And um, if you've gone into Walmart, that's type two non-combustible. You're gonna have um, you know, these, these metal trust systems that you look up and you can see the flat roofs. You, you don't notice um, from the exterior or the interior, the amount of things that are on that roof, all the HVAC and, and everything else, all the weight that is already on the roof. And, and they don't always just put those over the, over the I beams, of course. So if you look at that roof on this picture, that ceiling, it looks kind of flimsy. And to be right honest with you, if under fire conditions, those little uh, trust systems don't last very long. Now, what's nice about most of these buildings, your Walmarts and your, your Menards and Home Depots is that they are going to be well sprinklered. So for the most part, they're gonna keep fire conditions in one area, uh, if not put it out, and then you have that understanding of where it is and be able to go put it out. Ordinary, which, would I, which is what I was speaking about earlier, your downtown, you know, wherever Illinois, where you've got uh, generally masonry walls, uh, 
and you're going to have wooden beams, joists, and roofs and floors that are made of wood. It's, it's an old school way of building things. They're trying to make buildings now that look like this because that uh, brick facade is a neat look. You know, it's, it's a thing that a lot of people like to look at. So we have to be able to understand what is an original ordinary construction like this and what newer buildings have, you know, brick veneers and facades that are just made to look that way. Because one is going to definitely be a little more dangerous to firefighters. So ordinary construction, like I said, you've got your eight inch brick walls, generally eight inch. You're gonna have a, an I-beam, <coughs> excuse me, and more wood floor joists that run across. If you don't see any of these supports from underneath, then you've got some kind of engineered system and that engineered system can create spaces that are important for us to understand. If we've got, I think it might, yeah. So normally a joist free span does not exceed 25 feet. So if that span is over 25 feet and there's nothing in the middle, you don't see some type of support, you're under some kind of some type of engineered system. So start pulling that ceiling because if you've got an engineered system, there's going to be um, void spaces or, you know, that long run, if it's under contact with fire, you have to start worrying about it falling in on you. Type, type three, uh, you're not going to find this too often. Um, <clears throat> concealed spaces in general. So there's more of your type three kind of stuff. And what's great is we've all got these, all of us, somewhere in our district. I know maybe there are some very, very rural areas uh, that aren't going to have this typical downtown area, but we've all got building types like this. So understand how they work. As a fire officer, it's important for us to understand the layout of these buildings, especially if they're in our district, and understand how, um, fire, how fire is going to work under certain conditions in these buildings. And if we have fire in these buildings, how do we attack it? What is, what is our first step? So, I mean, we look at this, we see several different things that should, you know, be important to us. Um, we've got a pretty close building, you know, on both sides. How do we protect those buildings? We've got, you know, just one large front window door area. We've got, you know, these block windows along the side. Are we going to be able to use those block windows? if we have to ventilate or we have to make a fire attack from that window. All things that we have to think about and we should be thinking about, we should be cognizant of as fire officers as we're driving down the streets in our districts. Heavy timber, um, we've probably all got a little something along these lines somewhere and it, it might be old barns uh, that are made of heavy timbers and you've seen them. I mean, the heavy timbers, there's a lot of fire load in there because you've got all of this wood. But um, along with all that wood, you've got a, uh, that, that, those big timbers, those big six, 12 inch timbers, they take forever to burn through. So they will stay upright for a long time, but it's gonna be hot. There's just some more <coughs> heavy timber stuff, excuse me. Um, so this is also can be a severe exposure hazard because there's just going to be a lot of BTUs. You got a lot of heat that's building up in these buildings. So here's one, you know, that's been renovated. I'm sure we all don't have something like this, but it's just something to think about. It's as we're here, it looks like a, an ordinary building, uh, ordinary masonry construction building, but in reality, in, in the interior of this building is um, heavy timber. So we've got connections. Uh, it's very open on the inside of this building, but it's got all these heavy timbers and it's got these interesting connections and some of them look just like, you know, metal plates with nails or bolts that are connecting all this stuff too. So as we're thinking about <clears throat> fire impingement on heavy timber, how quickly will fire burn through, you know, these looks like maybe six by eights or, you know, two by tens, how quickly will those burn through? That's probably not what's going to give away first here. What we have to worry about is the connection point. 
of these. If, if that um, metal piece that's holding these together gives way, you're going to lose everything. So there's skylight in the atrium area of that building. And here's uh, just kind of another picture of the connection here. Um, so type five is wood frame. And that's what we're commonly going to see constructed in today's world when it comes to residential homes. Uh, everything is made of combustible materials. Combustibility in the contents unlimited fire spread on the interior and exposure hazards. There's, there's several um, different types of wood frame construction. You've got platform where each floor is constructed one on top of the other. You do have a nice bit of fire stopping in, in the stud spaces and that minimizes um, fire travel to different areas of the building. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get fire travel. It's just going to minimize it. So platform frame, <clears throat> you've got compression and, and <coughs> tension. Balloon frame uh, is a term that each of us as fire officers should know and understand. Uh, this is a balloon frame building. And generally you can kind of understand a balloon frame building or you know a wood, uh, balloon frame building when you look at it from the exterior. The windows will be situated vertically, one on top of the other. <clears throat> And if you look at that, there's one gag here on the right, but for the most part, the windows are vertically stacked. And what the way they built balloon frame is just one long run walls. And so you can have a, uh, a run, a chase in the wall that goes from the basement all the way to the attic. And that allows uh, fire and smoke spread easy from one part of the building to another, specifically, you might arrive and find a, an attic fully involved. Well, the fire actually began in the basement. So building construction in this particular fashion is important. You can actually, uh, the last class that we gave, uh, Ray Kalzinski uh, gave kind of a little insight onto these. He said, you can go up into one of these attics and you can go into the void space in the wall and you can drop a golf ball and that golf ball will go all the way to the basement. So you can kind of understand how these are important for us to recognize as fire officers when we show up. We have to worry about how fire moves uh, in all of these buildings, but balloon frame buildings um, are important for us to recognize. Well, real quick too, Nate, on that, like with the balloon frame, um, you might pull up and looks like there's the fires in the attic. You be tons of smoke pushing out of the, the eaves and stuff like that, so you might, you know, when you recognize it's a balloon frame, you might want to send somebody to the basement too, because that might be where the fire's at and it's pushing smoke up through the, the walls and stuff like that. So that's something to keep in mind also with the balloon frame, so. Yes, very, very dangerous for us as firefighters. So it's, it's something that we have to be quick at understanding how they, how, how fire can react in all these buildings. But uh, this one in particular can be an important case for us. If you, once again, if you're driving around, you're doing that, um, size up in your, in your district, you can recognize these balloon frame buildings. Just, just have a look, see how many of them are out there. Uh, like I said, windows are typically, they run in a straight line, they stack one on top of the other. And this is just kind of another illustration of how uh, you get those <clears throat> unimpeded fire travel from the lower areas to the attic. So here's another one. Uh, and you can just kind of see, we've got smoke coming from the attic space. We've got smoke coming from the first floor. And I bet you there would be smoke coming from the basement as well. <clears throat> so one other important thing that we as fire officers have to recognize in building construction and of course, like I've said about fire dynamics, building construction can be its own 40 hour class and you have to continue to think your way through all of this stuff. But <clears throat> what is constantly affecting a building, uh, whether it is under fire conditions or not, or any kind of de uh, demolition, we have to recognize 
the internal, the internal enemy of every building. Gravity, always pulling on a building. We don't think about it very much, and, and I don't think about it very much, but it is always pulling on a building. So as we add you know, certain stresses to all of these buildings, we have to be aware of what those are doing to the building. <clears throat> all right, it's 1054 is what I've got, guys. We're gonna go ahead and take ourselves a little break. We're gonna take 10 minutes here. So we'll start back up at 11.04. Thank you for uh, uh, listening to me chatter away here for, for about an hour. I want you to go ahead and get up, get stretched out, go get yourself something to drink if you need and use the restroom. We will, uh, we'll get back on here at 11.04.
All right, guys, we got a couple of minutes here before we get back uh, to really getting fired up. <clears throat> I want to uh, tell everyone how much I appreciate you all taking your Saturday mornings and uh, coming to watch or, or listen or hopefully learn a little something about uh, company officer stuff. I know that there's been uh, several of these and and it, it's taking us as instructors a little while to kind of get into the swing of trying to, to give a class uh, without responses and it, it, without being able to, to, to see the students if you're trying to instruct it, it takes a little bit of getting used to. So I hope this delivery method is working for everyone. We're, we're working it hard at trying to make it interactive in, in several ways. So uh, I hope, you, I hope you, you can get this. But um, Stephen, if you want to go ahead and, uh, and yeah. what you want to do here, we'll get started. Uh, we, we were talking about the building instruction. One thing I was going to tell you guys, one, one thing would help you or it helps me is when you go on EMS calls, when you go to certain types of homes, look at the home, how it's laid out, like a ranch home. I know it's one of the primary examples we always use, but a ranch house is pretty much laid out the same regardless, you know, where, wherever you go. Either you go in the front door and the left side, you know, you got the bedrooms to the left, then the living room, kitchen area on the other side. Or it's just flip flops, you know, in like the garage on the other, like the opposite end of the, the bedrooms and stuff. You got bungalows, you've got your old farm style houses. When you go in, in these places on EMS calls or any type of calls, look at that type of thing. Another thing, what you can do is in your districts, as new homes are being built, see if you can get a hold of the, the builder and say, hey, can we take a walk through here real quick with some newer guys? And even if it's for yourself, to look and see how things are built and how things are laid out. That would help you guys understand the building. Understand how the building's laid out. So when it is all covered up with drywall and all the furnishings, you have a, a mental picture behind the scenes. Um, like when you do inspections, if you guys do inspections like we do our downtown area, when I've been on those, the business is on the main floor, but sometimes they have the keys to the upstairs, like those big ordinary construction buildings. We got in there and got to look through there, see how things were built constructive we had a building in Quincy that is tore down now but it was a one of those heavy timber buildings and it was a McCormick Deering place so they built tractors there are parts for tractors and stuff there I never did hear exactly what they built but when you look at the floor it was crisscrossed and they were like two by sixes or two by eights or whatever there was the floor so I mean you weren't just gonna go up there and punch through the floor real quick but that was something good to know if you ever got into that building and could see what it, you know, you understood what how it was built and stuff. So it was built super heavy, a super heavy fire load and stuff like that. So when you get a chance to go on inspections, maybe the owner will let you look into other areas to understand it better. Um, learning building construction too is also important. Look at like, when you go in there, look at where the vents are, like the, that will help you determine where the bathrooms are, kitchens. Now it kind of give you a middle picture of how the house is laid out too before you go in. Also, like small windows on the side of a house, that might be a landing for a stairwell in older homes and stuff. Like, there's just little things that is, the more and more you guys do stuff and go and look at these things, that'll help you understand it better. Some of you might be builders already understand all this stuff. So, um, take every opportunity you can to do that. If you ever get a chance to go with Jeff Latz to do building construction stuff, that guy has it. He he's phenomenal with it. So. Um, I still do the building instruction tour with him whenever we do the academy because I still learn something from him every time he does it. So uh, that's all I got to say, Nate. You did tell him about asking questions on the question and answer, right? I, I did not. Um, if you want to hit okay. that, I'm going to reload my PowerPoint. Real quick, guys, you got this question and answer area down here, this button on the bottom of your screen. If you have questions at any time, Definitely click on that, ask a question. We'll get it answered. If we can't, you know, if I don't know the answer, I'll ask Nate or I'll find somebody that knows the answer to help you guys out and uh, make sure you get the most out of this class. So, all right. Okay, thanks guys. Um, I lost my PowerPoint there. I lost my spot, so I gotta find it real quick. So. If you'll bear with me for just a second, I remember where we were. 
Another balloon frame. <clears throat> All right. Oh, this new technology. Just, uh, there we go. Steven, am I good again? Am I back? Am I back to normal? You're back to normal. Very good. That's, uh, I don't know if anyone would agree with you, but thank you for that anyway. <laughs> so knowing how a building has been constructed and the materials used in construction helps us develop a plan for fire attack. And that's, um, really just exactly what Steven was just kind of commenting on. Um, if you know what you're getting into, um, and this will help constantly, if you kind of recognize the types of construction and the ways homes are constructed, to be able to make that first decision when you arrive on scene, if it's, you know, three in the morning and you're going to a single story ranch house, uh, like Steve talked about early, you know that, you know, life safety is an important thing for us to be thinking about at three in the morning to a residential home. And as we arrive, if we're, if we're looking at a, a ranch house, we know we've got the garage on the one side and the bedrooms on the other, we can immediately understand the decision-making process for as company officers. We're the first people there. We've got a fire, you know, Maybe it's just in the garage, but it's still three in the morning and you've got smoke throughout the house. You know immediately the first decision is life safety is rescue. Can I make it in that A side door? And we're going to go over A, B, C, and D in a little bit. But can I get in that front door? Can I make that turn down the hallway? And knowing that the garage is on the left, the bedrooms are on the right as I come in that door. That, that helps us with that decision-making process considerably. So uh, digest all this material. Think about uh, how a home is constructed and, and the decisions that we would have to make as officers when we arrive, whether it be 3 a.m. or 2.30 in the afternoon, or maybe even earlier than that, you know, 10 or 11 on a school day. How, how or what do we, what decisions should we make at that time? What is or what would a fire do in this building? So size up. So it's important for us uh, to think about size up. And I, I kind of talked to you about a little exercise I want to try to do. Um, it, it might take us a little bit of time here, but I think it's important for us to understand size up. Size up uh, gives us, <clears throat> and when we're talking about company officers here, I'm not constantly just talking about the first do, first person on scene. However, that is a very important part of the product I'm trying to convey to you. As being a company officer doesn't just, you're not just that first person. Sometimes you're in that second engine company, or maybe you're in a big enough, big enough, uh, fire department that you're running a truck company that's coming in or a rescue or, or a squad or any of that stuff. Or maybe you're just arriving in your pickup truck <clears throat> as a volunteer or somebody who's been called in from off scene. Size up is important coming from that first officer because then it, the, the next people who are coming, the next crews, the next trucks, uh, the next individuals, they get to glean a lot of information from what is given by that initial size up. So I want everyone, and we all take for granted many times uh, that people understand verbiage and, and <clears throat> certain terms in the fire service. But I want first everyone to understand what A side, B side, C side, and B side means. If you're looking at a building, generally the addressed side is the A or alpha side. And then you simply move clockwise. So going left, that the left side of the building is then B or Bravo. The rear or the back side of the building is Charlie or C side. 
And of course, the right would be the D side or delta side. But I do have uh, something I want to try to show you if I can find it here. So bear with me for just a second. Just yes. remember with the Alpha Bravo Charlie sides and stuff like that, it, it isn't always going to be the address side. I mean, the biggest thing is, as long as everybody's on the same page, that you guys are going in that Alpha, you determine Alpha is this side. You know, maybe your department says whatever door the hose is going in will always be the Alpha side. Maybe you determine every time the street address side is going to, always going to be the Alpha side. But you guys got to come up with the game plan so everybody's on the same page because if you don't, something happens and we're not on the same page and somebody goes down, you need help with a rescue, whatever it is, and nobody's on the same page with Alpha Bravo, that can cause a big problem getting somebody out or life safety issues. Yeah, come up, Steve. Nope, we have a blank screen. Oh, there it is now. It's up. Okay. Um, so this is just, I, I know it could be bigger. It's kind of small. Um, when I share this in Zoom, I get this uh, bar across the top that doesn't allow me to actually uh, increase this. So I'm sure you could probably all see it unless you're trying to look on it, watching this class on a cell phone. But this is just, the, you know, the red in the middle is your structure. You got Alpha in the front, Bravi, Char Bravo, Charlie, and Delta. And Steve is definitely right. You know, generally uh, Alpha is going to be the side toward the street, but sometimes homes will face in unusual orientations. And you'll recognize where Alpha is by where that first engine company is setting up. Um, how are they going to fight the fire? And if they're giving you a good size up, you'll understand where Alpha is anyway. So what my plan is right now is I'm going to pick three or four um, randomly chosen participants. So I hope uh, that you're not just uh, upstairs, you know, eating your lunch with the computer on in the basement because I'm going to call on you. <clears throat> when I call on you, I'm going to bring you up. You'll come over to the main screen. Your name will. I, and your, your mute will be turned off at that point. And I'm just going to give you a picture. And I want you to give me a size up of the picture that I'm, I'm going to give you. So if, uh, if you guys are ready, we're going to do this. I'm going to do a couple like that. Then I'm going to go over a size up card, which I've, I've kind of got downloaded. It kind of gives step-by-step -step size up considerations. And then we'll try a couple other more people. So I apologize for the first two or three people. You guys are the, are the people who don't get the benefit of seeing a size up card. So first, uh, we'll just do the first page here. Bradley, is it Bliven or Bliven? I don't know, but I'm promoting you to panelist right now. Bradley, are you with me? Yeah, I just had to activate the mic there. All right, very good. Um, how are you doing? Doing well, doing well. Good. I have family in the background, so you might hear them that's as well. A, that's, that's just fine. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share a picture with you, and uh, I want you to do just a quick size up for me, all right? How do you see? Do you see that all right? Yeah, just show there. Um, let's see. Uh, engine 111, on scene, two-story, residential. Um, we have uh, smoke showing from the roof on Alpha and Delta corners. We'll be pulling inch and three quarter, moving to offensive attack, and then identify water supply source as well and any uh, needs that we might have as well. First truck company comes in, we'll go ahead and make sure we get ladders to Division 2, um, possibly start venting, and then also primary searches. That was incredible. That's not fair. <laughs> well done. Um, and so as, as all of you could probably hear, he, he gave a, an incredibly good size up for that particular structure. He gave us what he needed, what he saw. And I mean, those are the biggest things. What do you see? Where's everything at? Um, who, and needs. Now, when I get to that card, and he pretty much covered everything on the card, but you, you're going to kind of just get a, a dot by dot. What, what else do we need? 
let's see. Let's do someone else here. Uh, Michael Lynch. Michael Lynch, come on down. Are you Hi. with me, Michael? Here. Can you guys hear me? I'm gonna. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Are you prepared? Yeah, we'll see how it goes. I, I think you'll do fine. All right. Let me find you a good picture here. Uh, here's one. All right, Michael, whenever you want, what do you see? What do you got? What do you need? All right. It's, uh, got a one story type four residential. A uh, house with a fully involved garage fire, possible duplex exposures on the uh, Delta side. A standby 360, kind of the front of engine uh, 4311. I'll need a frontal attack from the exterior. Uh, uh, hopefully we know where the plug is. So take a water supply in the first two engines, hit the plug. Yeah, okay. And uh, we need uh, passing command to uh, first arriving chief officer and engine 4311 will be attack. Awesome. That's, that's another great, that's another great size up. Thank you, Michael. Um, it, he hit everything, uh, specifically one thing that I, that I wanted to make sure that we got on that particular one uh, were the exposures. And that's an important thing for us to point out in size ups because, and like I said, it's the next companies, the next companies that are coming in, uh, the information that you're giving them is giving them the information to to make decisions on what to do when they arrive. Um, if you're letting them know about uh, exposures and uh, or maybe needs for water supply, they they can kind of start making those decisions before they even arrive. We'll do one more here. One more. Um, Scott is a Clausen. Scott. Hi there. How are you? Uh, doing all right. Yourself? Doing well. Doing well. Thanks for being here. Uh, I'm going to give you a picture. I just want you to give me the, the best size up you can, okay? All righty. Let's see what I got here. All right. Whenever you start seeing it, go ahead and uh, give me what you got. Okay, one story residential. We got heavy smoke and flame coming from the roof. Uh, gonna pull a uh, inch and three quarter to go interior, get a uh, crew ready to go to the roof to ventilate on uh, when the interior crew says it's okay. Uh, get a, uh, a water supply set up. And yeah, that's all I got right now because I got like three kids hammering me. <laughs> that's okay. That, that's good. I mean, that, that's a good size up. Uh, one issue that, that we as firefighters uh, have to worry about and have to think about as we're giving any type of radio traffic is being concise. So if, uh, the amount of words you say on the radio aren't as important as the information that you're giving. I don't know if that makes sense or not, but uh, you got to be concise. Be concise with what you're saying. You know, a short, concise size up is better than a lengthy size up that you get while you're doing your whole 360. You know, so I'm going to show you something else here. All right, so here's just kind of a size up card. Uh, can you see that, Stephen? Just yep, wondering. I got it up. Okay, very good. Um, so you're announcing it, and the one on the left is for a structure fire, and the one on the right, you can probably tell by looking at it, is for a, a vehicle accident or 1050, uh, depending on whether you run 10 codes or not. Um, so your announcement is your arrival at the address, the number of floors, the occupancy type. And when we say occupancy type, we generally just to make this concise, to make this quick and, and doable, just residential or commercial. 
I mean, I guess you could add industrial to that as well. But for us, there's just the two, residential or commercial. If you give them the number of floors and then the occupancy type, there's a lot of information. There. And when we start trying to get into maybe um, the type of building construction and, and all of this other things, our size up stops being that nice, concise, quick size up and starts to run into length. You know what I'm saying? One thing with, it, one thing with that, Nate, too, real quick is, you know, if we know it's a resident and we say, hey, it's a resident, the thing is you got to think about, okay, if, in Quincy, if we're going to the west end of our town by the river, that's old construction. Those are old homes. So we know they're going to be two, three-story residentials or the attic's going to be almost like a third floor. You know, they're going to be built out of brick, all that stuff like that. We already kind of know that. If we go to the east end, there's going to be newer construction, more open floor plans. You know, certain parts of the town have a lot more ranch homes. Um, we still need to announce the number of floors and stuff because sometimes there's oddball, you know, residents there. But you, if you know your different districts, you have a pretty good idea that this part of town is homes built in the 60s or the homes built in the 90s, whatever it is. And that should give you a pretty good indication and stuff like that, too. So that's that's another important part of this is knowing your districts for size up. And then when that call comes in, they say, you know, whatever the address is, that ought to be clicking in your head like, OK, that's, an, you know, that. that uh, area was built in the 80s. It's primary resident uh, ranch homes, so that'll all start clicking in your head of, of what you're going to have. Now you still need to tell everybody what you got because if a house was tore down, something new was built that was totally different. Well, you got to know that too. So yeah. So yes, and that's why size up never stops. And I think I've kind of said that a couple of times now. But uh, don't. You know, as you're driving through town, you know what town is, what your town is like. And if not, start studying that stuff. It, it's, it'll be more important to you as you continue on your careers as firefighters. But you're here, you know what you, you're given what you have, you know, the occupancy type, and then the involvement. What is going on? Where is the smoke? Where are the flames? Is it visible? And then what do you need? So that's, like I said, that's you passing that information on to that next new engine company or truck company or whomever. What do you need? You need water supply. You need ventilation right away. Um, are you going to be working rescue? Um, do you see somebody hanging out of a second floor window? We're, you know, make, make that stuff known. You know, engine company six is on scene. We've got a two-story residential structure. We've got flames on the B, C corner. We've got a victim hanging out of a window on the A, D corner. Engine six is going to be pulling a, a ladder and making that rescue. That engine, that, that's what you got, you know. We, we're unable to establish command at that time because you might not have enough people to do so. But your mode of attack also won't matter either because everybody understands that that mode of attack at that point is out the window because you're on rescue, um, you're in rescue mode. But that is what we're doing. We're, we're in rescue. Now establishing command, every, everyone kind of wants to scoff at when you arrive on scene and you give all of these, um, you know, all, all this information to, to establish command in most uh, organizations, everyone recognizes how NIMS works and that first due uh, company officer is the commander until he is relieved by someone with you know, a higher rank. That's how most situations work. Well, the point of this is what if I arrive and the second company that arrives is from a mutual aid department, you know? Who's in command at that point? We're both, you know, the same rank, all this other company officer stuff. Or what if that next due company, the second company that arrives is an incident, is a chief from a mutual aid department? Are they, do they then have command? That's fine if, if that's the way your agreements work, that, that next due chief, whether it's from a mutual aid department or your own department, uh, then becomes the commander, that's fine. But to establish command, then everyone knows that at that time I'm in command. But then when that chief arrives, 
he can then verbally establish command and take that command upon himself. And that's cool. But at least everyone understands who's in command at the time, right? And like I said, it gets a little murkier for uh, Mavis and mutual aid calls. So that's why you establish a command. If it's you know a downtown district that the only people that are going to show up are going to be your fire department and you understand how how your command structure works and that's that's not going to be an issue then, then then by all means understand that i'm I'm not telling you to do this in any certain way there's certain s o p s and s o g s at every fire department that uh that will show us how and that that you have to follow so you can say hey, Nate. Yeah, go ahead. I, I, somebody just asked a question on the question and answers. Uh, if we announce that all the vac, all the uh, victims or all the residents are out of the home, that's something we will do if we're, we we got to confirm from somebody that lives there that everybody's out. But if we don't know, you still got to do the search and still be thinking about somebody could still be in there because you hope the person telling you that is the resident and you can trust them. But at the same time, we can't – You don't, it's not that you don't want to trust somebody, but you still don't want to – so my, oh, everybody's out of the house and and they're not, and then you're sitting there not doing a search like you should. That you know, but announcing that hey, somebody that lives here has said that everybody's out out of the home and stuff like that. So everybody kind of will know that, but at the same time, don't disregard doing your searches and, and still verifying everybody's out out of the house. So yeah, if any of you are old like me and have teenage kids, I have teenage daughters. I allow them to spend the night, of course, at friends' house. Um, yeah, I, I, I verify, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I, I believe but verify. So, and it's the same way. If, if you hear or a neighbor comes over and says, hey, everyone's out of the house, that, that's okay. You can, you can believe that, but uh, it needs to be verified either way. Uh, a lot of times dispatch will make that uh, call based on information they've gleaned from the caller. That doesn't mean that our um, our tactics need to change. Now, don't get me wrong. If we hear everyone is out of the building and we were getting ready to do a, a rescue um, mode of, you know, we were getting ready to go into rescue mode to get in there, and then we hear that that everyone is out. That's that's great. We can probably switch to a mode of attack of offensive. And to be right honest with you, one of the most important things I've learned is the best thing that we can do as firefighters for victims is put the fire out, you know? I mean, don't get me wrong. If we can get in and get out with the rescue, that's important. But putting the fire out and changing the conditions inside of a home are sometimes the most important thing. And like I said, the thing on the right here, that's, uh, you know, size up for vehicle you know, situations. And for well, the we most a, part, everybody understands that. We, I have a prime example where we went to a fire that the, uh, actually the kid set it on fire and the parents or the people thought he was still inside. But after he actually set the house on fire, he took off, went up to the mall. So we're in there looking for him, looking for him. And then um, somebody came back and said, oh, they found him. He's at the mall. So then that changed their mode of attack. So I got a question here from, uh, uh, looks like Jay Graff. Would you add hazards on a size up for commercial structure fire? You bet. Um, it's it's an important thing for us. All all hazards. If if we see something that we know is hazardous, or something that is important for the income incoming companies and chiefs and whomever is coming, all, by all means, throw that on your size up. This is just a down and dirty uh, size up card that I'm kind of showing you. So, yes, yes, the hazards are very important. I mean, you might, you might see a, a LP pig sitting in the front door of the house. That's, that's an important thing. It wouldn't be a bad idea to, to give that on your size up. So we're going to do a couple more of these size ups. I got, I got a few more pictures we're going to throw up. So let's see. William Sterling, William Sterling. William, you with us? Might not get William. And if that's the case, that's okay. I hope might just have audio issues. 
So we'll uh, we'll work on somebody else here. Uh, Zach Price. Yep, I'm with you. All right, how are you, Zach? I'm not too bad. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and we're just gonna do a little more uh, this size up. Size up is very important. So I just want everybody, not everybody, I'm not gonna be able to get all of you, uh, of course, to give a good to give this size up. We just don't have the time. But randomly picking some guys out and listening to how other people give a size up is it's a good way to learn. Um, it's almost like why I do this instructing stuff, guys. I, I get to hear all of this in the different ways that different firefighters throughout the state handle different situations, and it becomes an incredibly good piece of information for me to digest. So, all right, Zach, I'm gonna I'm gonna share I'm gonna share a picture with you. Let's see if I can find one. All right. Whenever you see that picture, Zach, just go ahead and give me a size up. All right, can you still hear me? Yep. All right, uh, engine 37 on scene, uh, smoke and flames showing from the roof. Uh, first, or next engine company coming in, established water supply, uh, and uh, truck company come in and get a master stream on top. Um, it's a two-story, uh, looks to be commercial. Uh, we'll have an engine company stretch the engine three-quarter uh, in on the first story and uh, do a search. Good. Good. I mean, I don't have any issues with what you've said there. It kind of gives, you know, the, the next companies an idea of what's going on. Um, remember, like, your initial... Your initial thoughts are, you know, what do you, what type of building do you have? So it, the, throwing that in there as quick as you can, two-story commercial building, you know, is important. If you want to throw in, you know, it's a, you know, an auto repair shop, that's not a terrible idea, you know. And I, I know I'm just kind of blindsiding you with pictures here, so, and you don't have any backup information on what type of building this is, and I'm, I'm not faulting you for that. But as a second engine company coming in, knowing that I'm going to, you know, an, an auto repair dealership is probably pretty important because there's going to be stuff in this building that are important to the decisions that I'm going to make. So nice job. Appreciate it. Uh, let's see. Skyler. Is it, looks like Hilliker. Skylar, you with me? Hey, can you hear me? Yeah, yep, you're just fine. How you doing today? Just fine, working. Yeah? Can you do a little size up for me? Yeah. Cool. Just a sec, I'll, I'll try to find you something interesting. All right, whenever, uh, whenever you see what's on the screen, you go ahead and give me a size up. 3911's on scene of a two-story residential, fully involved, smoke out of all four, all four sides, exposures on the B and D side. Uh, we pull out a two and a half, uh, move this to the full stellar level. Uh, 39, 14, 11, command at this time. Great. Perfect. Um, I assume what you were talking hey, about there was going, going defensive. Is that correct, Scott? Correct. Yeah, that's, uh, that's good work. So, I mean, as, as first two engine company officers, we've got decisions to make on, on uh, whether we're going offensive or defensive. And in some situations like that, when we're first there and it's just us and a couple other guys or, or, or just one company and we might, for, for most of us, for most of us, we're not going to get more than nine, 10, 12 guys on that scene, especially initially. Um, and for some rural companies, you might only have two or four people on the scene 
for who knows how long. It might be 10, 15, 20 minutes before you get additional help. So, hey, hey Nate, real quick, I have a question. Somebody wanted to know why does everyone relay what line or what they're stretching, like what size hose? That's important because if you're the next company in, you know, if they pull a two and a half and your truck only has 500 gallons of water, it's not going to take long before they're out of water. So that's going to tell you, hey, we need to get our hyd get the hydrant quicker, get hooked up faster. You know, it, that's going to make a big difference. Plus, they might they're going to need help moving that hose through the building. So by knowing what size line they're stretching, that gives you a an idea of what you got too because they're saying they're pulling a two and a half that probably is a good indication it's a the fire's really going so that's going to hopefully get in your mind and you're going to think oh crap this is big we need to get moving or, or change your your mindset when you pull up too so what needs to be done so all right we're going to do hopefully one answers more your these. question yeah we're going to do one more of these so let's see who do i got here i got Oh, Richie. Richie Stack, come on down. How are you, brother? Are you with me? Are you on a device that won't allow you to talk to me? There you are. You got me now? Got you, Rich. Thanks for What's being up, on. brothers? You're suggesting hunt. How much? All right. I'm How are you doing, Rich? I'm so what's you happening? Okay, you can put me on. Let me get back and uh, see here. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm gonna do it my way how we do it here. So I'd That'd be, be perfect. Okay, engine 47 is on the scene. We got a two and a half story frame residential. We had fire and smoke showing from the roof. Um, we're gonna be stretching line. We are facing, uh, I'll just say northbound and we're stretching the line. That's all I'd pretty much say on our end. Um, for the second arriving company, and if it was the truck that wrote us, I typically don't report for the truck. The truck would just say truck 30 on the scene, side A. And that's pretty much how we start, how we would do our report. Um, the only other thing I would add at the time, if anything would be pertinent as far as any issues or problems, I can't tell from the picture. It almost looks like it's a cul-de-sac, maybe. If it is, that's something I would definitely report over the radio. And I'm just going from a picture, a Snapchat in time here. Uh, if it was a cul-de-sac or a dead end, I would, I would announce that. We're real big on the truck having the front of the building because we can stretch hose. We can't stretch ladders beyond their length. So if it was a cul-de-sac, I would hold short and let the truck actually go first to get the front of the building if it was at the dead end of it. The only other thing, if there are any life safety or hazards, doesn't look like I have an exposure at this time either. Just exposure at this time looks like it would be the brush or interior exposures more than anything. Perfect. Thanks, Rich. No problem, brother. So he just, so Rich gives us a lot of different things to think about when we're, when we're uh, considering how to set our engine companies or truck companies. What is the best way to, to park our um, equipment? So as company officers, once again, it's a decision that, that actually you should have to make. Now, for most of us, we're going to have a dependable driver and someone who probably recognizes where they should go before you know we arrive on these scenes anyway. And so that thought process won't have to really be at the forefront of your mind. But it does have you do have to think about this. If if you've got a truck or a stick or a nozzle um, that you're going to set up in front of the house, you don't want to take that space away uh, with the engine company. Unless, you know, it may be part of your SOPs that the engine company drops in front of the house for quick attack. But um, all good points. So I hope you guys kind of enjoyed that. We, uh, we're trying to make these so it's a little bit more, um, I don't know, cooperative between the participants and, uh, and us guys. And, you know, I just don't want to sit here and talk at you and at least a little bit of back and forth with with some of the panelists or the attendees is, is important to me. So I hope you got a little something out of that. Remember, uh, scene size up is an important part, a basic part for a company officer. So uh, we'll get back to the PowerPoint here. Oh, here it is. All right. So we just gotta, uh, we're just gonna, move through the end of the PowerPoint, and we'll have maybe a couple of minutes at the end of it to, 
to just kind of talk about officer responsibilities and what you guys think. Um, or, well, if you get questions and answers, we'll, we'll talk about it. So the first new officer, responsibility of the company officer to see what his or her company does, to see that they do what it's ordered to do. You're going to get orders as the company officer, and then you're going to give orders as the company officer. And all of that rolls down and uphill right to you. The company officer cannot afford to show any signs of weakness at the fire scene. You have to be concise. You got to be comfortable in your skin and be able to make those decisions quickly. Things that can go wrong, you know, and these are all things that if you just look at, you'll, you'll understand the problems that you can have. So vague or incomplete orders. And as a company officer, that works both ways. If a, a chief or a captain or whomever is a, is the next rank up is giving you orders. You want to be able to understand what those orders mean, but you also want to have the um, ability to get things done your own way. Uh, so vague or no progress, lack of initiative. If you pull the wrong hose line, if you don't do the search when you should, uh, reluctant to open up windows and holes, unreal fear of water damage, failure to update tactics. I'm sure you guys can read all this. So other fire ground errors. Yeah. Hey, real quick. I had a question that wanted to know if would you upgrade the alarm on your initial size up? If you pull up and it looks like that thing is rocking, you're going to need a lot of extra help. I would call for extra help or tell the, the you know, the instant commander, the battalion chief, whatever you guys have that, hey, we're going to need an extra alarm and call it because you can always call them off. If you get going and it's not as bad as you think, you can always cancel the other companies. You can't make up the lost time, you know, that by waiting to call them and then they finally get on, you know, get moving to get there. You might have lost out on two or three, four minutes of them already being on scene. So if that makes sense, I would call them and you can always cancel them. I would not wait, you know, if you feel like you're going to need it. So that's all, Nate. I can't, I can't agree with what Steven said more. Um, if you feel like you need help, if you feel like this, the, the people that you've got coming is not enough, upgrade it. There, you should not be uh, reprimanded for making a safety decision. And if you are, then whoever that officer is that's reprimanding you is not a very good officer. So always, if you have to ask for help, ask for help. We have a problem and it's right on here, common fire ground errors, errors. call for help too late. We have a problem as firefighters in believing that we don't ever need help. We can get a job done by, you know, beating something or breaking something. We have to learn that there are limits to what we can do and calling for help is not a problem. So uh, other fire gun errors, we just kind of went over this with uh, Richie Stack, apparatus positioning, uh, making that decision of exterior versus going in, poorly positioned hose lines, uh, no or improper vents, uh, undersized use of PPE, PPV for attack. When we do positive pressure ventilation, guys, which is what we're talking there with PPV, it has to be part of a coordinated fire attack. A coordinated fire attack is the ability to coordinate your attack with your ventilation. So recognize how to work that and do it properly. If you are pushing oxygen or air into a house before you've got an attack line ready or in place, all you're doing is feeding that fire. And I think that most of us probably recognize what happens when we give that fire more air and oxygen. Too much I see, too little firefighting, and lot, lots of talk, chatter. We don't need that for communication. And you're gonna find as, as officers, one of the biggest errors that you're gonna have or one of the places where everything just kinda all, all ends up going to hell is communications. We have to be able to communicate uh, concisely and properly. You're going you're gonna to find on fire grounds that you're going to have issues with some officers that just talk, 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 and really never say anything. Don't be that officer. Be sure that you can communicate quickly and concisely. So yes, yeah, just tell Tell important information. If it's something important, pass it on. If it's something that doesn't need to be told, don't do it. Because as an officer, if you're inside working and somebody keeps, you know, the incident commander keeps asking you questions, that gets frustrating because you don't feel like you can get any of your work done. 
But with that being said, as an instant commander, they're on the outside looking in. You know, two minutes seem like an eternity, eternity to them, while to you it's no time at all. So you got to look at things and put them in perspective. But at the same time, you know, you got to let people work if you're, you know, and you also got to get your job done. And all the extra talking does not help because if you're an officer, you're going to stop and listen to the radio too to try to hear what you're doing. That's going to mess up your workability too when you're trying to get things done. Yeah. So size up, we, I've just kind of talked about it. It's an ongoing situation before we're at, we're off of work. When you're in route to the, to the scene at the firehouse, talking to other personnel or members, equipment, um, Stephen and I actually work at the same fire station. He get he gets off. Are you, you will work today, Steve? I think you're at work today. He gets off tomorrow morning. Uh, I'm actually yep. off off tomorrow, so I won't be going in. But generally, I will follow him. I I get information from him as he goes home. He lets me know what happened that day. Um, wh what kind of situations they had? Did they have any uh, fires? Did they have any EMS calls? Uh, car accidents? And what happened at those calls? Is all the stuff on the truck tip top? Uh, maybe we've got a problem with one of our SCBAs that we've looked into. Maybe the truck's having an issue and they had to send it to go get uh, repairs done. He's going to let me know all of that stuff. Those are all important things for me and important things for one company officer to do for another company officer. Um, size up continually. We've kind of gone through this stuff and these are all things that go through your head. What's the weather like? What's the address? Where is it at in your city? The type of response. Do you need other alarms and other information needed? And those things are all going to go uh, while in route. So radio report. We talked about this, your description. Like I said, be brief. And if you need help, call for it. You have to think about life hazard, occupancy, all these things. We have to do a 360, guys. And I don't know if I've kind of stressed that enough. Uh, when, when you're finished with your, with your size up on the radio as the first new company officer, let them know if you're going to be out on a 360. Because that 360 might take you a couple of minutes. Hopefully, the rest of your uh, crew is good enough and, and trained well enough that they can you know, start setting out that hose line, getting it prepared, the, the the guy who's running the rig can get prepared to, to give you water. They got the pump running. Your your jump man is, you know, taking the hose line to the front door while you're doing that 360. But a 360 is important for us as first new officers to take that 360 and to see what's going up going on on all sides of the building. You might not see much on the front, but you get to the back and you got fire blowing out of a second story window. Once again, talking about the bag method. Uh, where's it been? Where's it at? Where's it going? And I've, I know I've harped on this enough, but understand fire dynamics, be able to read smoke. What type of smoke do you have? Is it pushing? Is it black? Is it light? And then apparatus placement. Uh, exposures, what's going on on the exterior of the home and the interior? Where is command? Uh, do you have enough people? Do you have a uh, big enough department that you can have an interior command and an exterior command. Generally, for most of us downstate, uh, we're not going to be able to, to set up an interior command unless we're going to be at a huge scene for an amazingly long amount of time. Uh, ventilation, we need to recognize when to ventilate, where to ventilate, and that can also be part of your scene size. Of, hey, I need vertical ventilation in the A, B corner, you know. Access, where, where are we making access? Do we have to force a door? Are we forcing that front door? These are all considerations for us. We are also uh, in charge of the protection and safety of our officers and or our, our firefighters. That has to be very important to us, probably first and foremost, the safety of the guys and gals that are going into this fight with us. So keep that in mind, it's very important. So intrinsic fire protection, what, what do they got? How much manpower? What's the apparatus that we're pulling in? The terrain? And these are all things that size up can come into play with. Do we need to let them know the next new company? You know, it's a long gravel road access. It's been raining. 
we're not going to be able to get the truck down this road. So you're going to have to leave the truck out. You need to assign the companies that are arriving, if possible, uh, where are they going to go? If, if engine company two is the next new company, you need, you need them to start ventilation. Let them know that. For the most part, there's going to be SOPs or SOGs assigned to um, the companies as they arrive. The first new company generally is going to be either rescue or fire attack. Your next new company might be um, water supply in one way or another, whether it's a hydrant or setting up a tanker and tender. Uh, and then the third new company might be RIT, which is also always an important situation to be in. Go to work, be sure you slow down, work smarter, not harder. Very important thought. When, when we're new to the fire service, like I said, we just want to go bashing walls and put the wet stuff on the red stuff. As company officers, we have to slow down. And that doesn't mean to slow down physically. It means slow down think, your thinking thought process. We still have to make our decisions quickly and concisely, but work our way through some of the information and some of the situations that we might find ourselves in. Probabilities, possibilities, that kind of comes back with uh, where's it been, where's it at, where's it going. With our, our backgrounds in building construction and fire dynamics, we should understand the probabilities and the possibilities of what's going to happen. Do you need utilities turned off? As a size up, that's a good thing to kind of understand. Hey, we've got you know gas line on the seaside. Uh, can you give me the gas company to get this turned off? If you are unable to do it yourself, um, you know, as the next companies, you need to be able to to understand what is going on at, at these uh, locations. And like I said, that size up is important. It's not necessarily so important for you giving it. It's important for the next companies that are arriving. That's what I've got. Um, I hope I didn't just talk at you about uh, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation speechiness there for a while. I tried to we tried to work in some of this extra stuff so um, so we can kind of get away from just me sitting here uh, talking <laughs> at a computer screen. You could probably recognize as as we all have been for however many years, we're used to sitting in classrooms and being able to gauge the room. And so this is different. It's an unusual situation for all of us. But uh, when it comes to company officers, it's important, like I said, you have to have the respect and you have to have the responsibility uh, to do what you're doing. Um, be competent and confident. Make your decisions uh, with those two things in mind. Uh, size up is important. And I hope you all got a little, little something out of this class. I appreciate that you're coming on. Steve, were there any questions that we need to uh, run over uh, before we sign off or you got stuff to add uh, I do have a question it says uh, any tips on for properly sizing the correct size of hose you know would you recommend a larger two and a half inch line for a first first for a quick knockdown or attempting a faster search with an inch and three quarter um, like I responded to them it's going to be kind of a there's there's no clear-cut answer it's going to be based on your experiences how you what you guys have for trucks. If you got a truck with very minimal amount of water and it's going to be a while before the next truck gets there, it's going to be a tough decision on what you're going to make. For us, you know, in Quincy, we've knocked down a fire before with the deck gun real quick and then stretched the inch and three quarter and went in and finished it up. But we also know within a minute or two, we're going to have water supply or within three minutes, whatever it is, we know it's going to be coming pretty quick thereafter. So if we go through, you know, 150, 200 gallons of water, 250 gallons of water, half our tank real quick. We know we have enough to make at least charge the line, get started because we'll have the, the water supply coming shortly thereafter. Um, some of you guys, it's going to take, you know, 10 minutes. You got to decide, is that the best way to go about it? So it, it's based on experience. There's really no, it's a hard, hard question to answer because I have to see what the building looks like when I pull up and stuff like that. So. Um, you have anything to add to that, Nate? 
I mean, no, it, like like you said, it's it's important um, that for for officers to to see what you got and then make that decision. Um, the two and a half inch, of course, you're just going to put a whole lot of water on, on the fire. It's it's an important tactic to be able to to recognize and understand. If you're running, you know, just two people on a, on an engine company, and you arrive and you're thinking about two and a half, you got to recognize that somebody's got to pump the truck. Now, one person hauling around that two and a half will work for a little while, but uh, it's going to wear you out pretty quick. Um, one announcement I want to make to everybody before we kind of end this: the CEQs for this class, since it's a weekend. They will be emailed to you, uh, but they won't be emailed until Monday morning. So, like I said earlier, please please take the time to fill those out. Tell us what you thought, um, how we can maybe change this to make it a little better, or, or what we did good. We'd appreciate knowing. Um, we'll probably we'll probably hang out here for another ten minutes and uh, and answer any questions that you guys have. Um, Steve, if you got any add anything else before we're off here. Uh, do um, I was just going to say, as a, as a company officer, if you're a firefighter and you don't like things in the, de in the department, like there's not, you know, you just don't like things, you can start, when you become a company officer, you can slowly start making changes, like with your own guys, where if you like, think you need to train more, do things, you know, get that culture going in your own station with your own guys, and maybe that'll start spreading and stuff like that, because we have guys, like everywhere, that's a cancer, that basically, they bring everybody else down, they don't, it, they don't want to do anything extra. They don't want to make themselves better. And that, that goes to everybody else and it kind of just starts filtering in. We'll be the guy that does the opposite of that. That gets people enthused about training. We got a new training officer in Quincy. Um, he's really good with that. He's getting everybody enthused about doing more training, doing things. And he wants to see a change because how it was before everybody just kind of got into a rut. So now things are starting to change. He's getting everybody on board. So you can start little by little as you move up through the ranks and hopefully see the changes you think needs to be done. But um, as an officer, always be studying, always learning, trying to expand your knowledge and get better. Talk to older guys, you know, and just because they're not an officer doesn't mean they don't have good experience. We got a guy in our department has no desire to be an officer, but he's very knowledgeable in a lot of things. I talk to him, ask him questions and that's the thing. Always be willing to learn and, and be open to everybody. So um, really other than that, I don't have a whole lot in A. I'm just kind of rambling on. So <laughs> That's all right, brother. Um, guys, it's, it's noon. We are done. So um, thank you all for coming. I hope you got something out of the class. Uh, it, like I said, Steve and I will probably hang out here for another 10 minutes or so. So if, you, if you've got questions, um, shoot them at us. If not, I appreciate you coming, and uh, be safe out got, there, and have a good weekend. We got to do that announcement again, Nate. The oh, I got to do the announcement again. Yep. Sorry. You want, you... <laughs> Let me see if I can find it here. Okay. Otherwise, I got it, Nate, otherwise, so. Uh, I got it right here. Okay. Uh, participants are eligible for a certificate, certificate of attendance in order to be eligible you must have formally registered for the class, the IFSI website. If you do not register, we will not have a record of you in our system. You must be signed into the virtual classroom through a Zoom account with your full name. It's got to match the name on your FSI account. Uh, for example, we can't tell who is president if you're signed in as iPad 7 or Phil, as there may be multiple Phil's in the class. If you watch as a group, your department will need to provide a full list of a full roster of attendees and then roster needs to be signed by your chief or training officer. Um, IFSI will then issue certificates based on the individual attendees. Only registered participants will receive a certificate of attendance. All participants must attend the full class to receive their certificate. It may take up to 14 days from the end of the class for certificates to show on your account. Certificates will not be mailed or emailed. They will be available in the student's personnel, uh, personal student central. Uh, on the resource center section at the IFSI website. If you got questions, uh, email them to fsi-elearning at illinois.edu. If you registered for this class on our website, you will receive an email containing a link to a course evaluation questionnaire 
That was just what I was talking about. That will be sent out on Monday. Uh, once again, please fill it out. Please take a moment to click on that. Uh, let us know what you liked about your experience, what you didn't like, uh, what you would like to see in upcoming courses. Your feedback is appreciated, and they are all read. A complete list of upcoming virtual classes can be found on the main page of the FSI website, www.fsi.illinois.edu, in the virtual cornerstone training. We'll be presenting this class. Well, we will not be presenting this class. I keep forgetting I don't want to read that part. Uh, the next virtual class will be thermal imaging cameras, uh, which will be held, and that'll be virtual, of course. It'll be held on Monday, July 6th from 6 to 8, and Saturday, July 11th from 10 to noon. General information, the main phone number for FSI, 217-333-3800. Website, which I just said earlier, fsi.illinois.edu. And if you need information, fsi-elearning.illinois.edu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend, guys.